Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Celeste Tyrell, and I am ANNA's Director of Online Learning and Innovation. Tonight's speaker is Jim Twiddell. Jim is ANNA's Health Policy Consultant and has been since 2005. He is the Senior Vice President of the District Policy Group and has extensive experience in and knowledge of the federal public policy making and legislative and regulatory processes. We are also joined by Sandy Mahalik, ANNA's Health Policy Special Interest Group Chair. Sandy will help us moderate questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, we encourage you to ask them via the GoToWebinar question panel, which should be on the right of most of your screens. We'll do our best to answer all questions after Jim has done his presentation. And on that note, Jim, I turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Celeste. I appreciate it. And good evening to everyone who's joined us. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in the webinar. And uh, tonight we're going to discuss what it is to be, what it means to be a nurse, uh, nephrology nursing advocate and why it matters. I want to start with a bit of an overview of what we're going to cover this evening. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my background and the district policy groups work with ANNA, and then we're going to talk about advocacy, the definition, the different kinds of advocacy uh, from a governmental perspective, legislative and regulatory advocacy, and then a little bit about what ANNA does in the advocacy space and what you can do uh, to learn more about it and how to get involved. So a little bit about the district policy group. Uh, the district policy group is part of a larger law firm called Drinker, Biddle and Reith. And we focus on healthcare issues, legislative and regulatory uh, for about 98% of the work we do is in healthcare and then other issues. It includes working with health professional organizations, uh, physician organizations, patient advocacy groups, and includes regulatory advocacy at CMS and other places, and uh, working with Congress on Capitol Hill and working on legislation. Also helping to, to try to guide organizations on their advocacy agendas and making sure that their members are prepared uh, to advocate on behalf of the organization. I have uh, worked at Drinker, Biddle & Reith, or the District Policy Group, for about 14 and a half years. Um, and in that time, we started working with ANA in 2005, as Celeste mentioned, and I've been working with ANA since the very beginning of that point. Um, and so myself and the team here provide ANA with guidance uh, on their advocacy agenda. We go and lobby Congress on, and agencies on behalf of ANA, um, as well as representing them in coalitions and doing uh, legislative and regulatory analysis. Um, of anything that might come up that's of interest as either a threat or an opportunity um, to the profession or the organization. Um, again, my background that I've worked um, in Washington uh, and in professional uh, policy and advocacy for um, for over 20 years, uh, the majority of it here at uh, Drinker, Biddle and Reith. Um, but again, I've worked with a and for, for now over 13 years. I worked on Capitol Hill before that in the Senate, and then um, I uh, also worked for the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. So my background in nursing policy issues and nursing education specifically um, was pretty deep before I came to work with a and um, And so I have some experience in, in some of the communities to which a and spends their time. So now let's get to the, the heart of what we want to talk about this evening is what is advocacy really and, and how can you do it? And I, I think it's a simple question, um, but I have found at times that uh, it can be um, intimidating for certain folks to consider health policy advocacy. Uh, they oftentimes think about going to Capitol Hill and meeting with politicians or people that they might see uh, on television or uh, people who are asking them to vote for them. And uh, it's a lot simpler uh, than you think, and it's a, you have a lot more power around it than, than you sometimes might know. Um, first and foremost, uh, in regards to petitioning your government, you have the right to go to all levels of government and have your voice heard, of course. But I think the more fundamental way to think about it is, is that you do this every single day in your job. 
nephro nephrology nurses are advocates for their patients every day and it's part of who you are and it's part of what you do however when we say well, go advocate not on behalf of your patients but on behalf of policies to promote your profession sometimes people find that to be challenging uh naturally they don't want to uh tout their or, you know do their own horn or, or go out and and um and, and point some of the things out that might help improve uh work they want to advocate on behalf of their patients but uh sometimes find it a challenge to go advocate on behalf of uh the profession what ana would like to do and what i'd like to help with is making sure that um all of the members are one interested in advocacy two have a good understanding of what it means and what's involved in it and how to do it effectively once you're able to learn how to do this effectively i think it can be very empowering and it can also be a lot of fun and the last thing i would say is that when it comes to um, advocacy on behalf of your own profession there is no one else that will do it for you um, we help provide guidance and i can provide suggestions and direction and thoughts, uh, but the only people who can really advocate on behalf of the profession is you. No one else will do it for you. No one else is capable of doing it. You have to stand up and tell Congress and uh, regulators and folks in uh, the state and local government what it is that you need on behalf of your profession. Um, and what we wanna do is help make that a little bit easier and show you how to do it effectively. And that's just a little bit of what uh, what we kind of want to cover and start on in this on this webinar. Okay, so we're going to go back a little bit and just look at a couple of things, which again seem like elementary or seem fairly basic, but for my perspective, it's always easy to kind of uh, take an overall look at what we mean when we're talking about health policy and advocacy. The two major places of government that have or policy that have an influence over nephrology nursing are at the state government level and at the federal government level. The work that I do on behalf of ANA is strictly at the federal level. However, the majority of uh, regulations and laws that will impact the practice of nursing, nephrology as well as other specialties, is at the state level. And I'm able to give some guidance on that about how to do it. Many of the principles are the same, but you also have to understand how these two entities are different. Um, so at the state level, um, every state is a little bit different in how their legisla legislature is structured. Uh, the practice acts in many states are not exactly the same. Um, and how the schedules for the legislature or how uh, the process is done in a bigger state like Texas or California versus that of Rhode Island or Connecticut is, is different, and there's obviously regional issues as well. So, um, and politics still plays a role in state government, but it's important to note that in state government, there things happen a lot faster. You can have success in a, in a, very, in a very quickly, and things move in such a way that you're able to see the impact of your own advocacy. Um, in, in, in contrast, the federal government's different. The federal government, it takes years and years and years to move even some of the, the what would seem the most simple policy changes or reforms. It takes a very, very long time. And as you see on the, even the, the news each evening, even battling over how much money we can provide to the federal government or keeping it up and running is even a challenge in uh, these particular times. So in the federal level, it's broader policies, national issues, and everyone who's advocating for some of these issues on Capitol Hill or in Washington is very well organized and there's tons of competition um, against each other to, to fight towards the end of certain policies. So it takes a critical mass or organized effort to see real change. Um, so that the federal areas of, of most importance to nephrology nurses would be the Medicare ESRD program, uh, biomedical research and nursing uh, education. And those are the main areas of federal programs that, that we work on. Um, and so it's, it's important to kind of bear that in mind when you think about um, the different levels of government and where you can uh, be effective in your advocacy. The other element is, is the difference between legislation and regulation. Uh, this oftentimes um, can, be, 
confusing because when I say advocacy or advocacy on health policy, it means both legislative and regulatory advocacy. So legislative advocacy is obviously it's produced bills, laws are produced at the state and federal le level by legislatures, by people who have been elected to office, uh, to legislate, to create the laws. Um, and that's an important factor to remember that when people are elected to office, um, they are um, political in nature, obviously, because they're politicians, but they're also um, tend to be more cautious uh, and influenced by what voters want to do. Um, they sometimes don't take risk and they want to go where there's consensus or broad support of issues. So that's just important to remember that when you can bring others along and you can show uh, that an issue has broad support, that's very appealing to someone who is working in a legislative body. Um, regulatory advocacy is a little bit more like the devils in the details. Um, after a law has been passed, it's an agency or a regulatory body that's going to actually implement it and work over some of the fine print. So as an example, uh, when the uh, Congress passed uh, and created through, uh, through legislation the bundle payment program, the ESRD uh, benefit, it, that was created by law, and then the regulators are charged with implementing it. So each year when they put out a proposed rule and work through a final rule, um, ANA and other organizations are advocating um, for those specific areas of regulatory policy. It's not Congress who's doing it. Um, Congress can get involved a little bit later uh, in the form of oversight, but for regulators, it's slightly less political and data matters a lot more. So it's a lot more about the facts and the numbers um, and how you go about uh, making your argument than the politics or the personal related story. Um, um, but the politics still exist in there, but it's just not as prominent. So. As we've looked at legislate, the legislation and regulation at the state and federal level, now I'm gonna focus just on the federal side um, uh, so that we can talk a little bit more specifically about some of the work that I cover and what, how you can be effective at a, at a federal level. Uh, so the fundamentals of, of how Congress are structured and the rules that govern the House and the Senate and how they're different is one of the most significant factors in how Washington operates. And we have to understand how fundamentally different these two chambers of the legislature are, and that in order for them to come together um, is actually not easy at all under the best of circumstances. So obviously everyone knows there's 535 members total. Uh, what's different? Well, in the House, each member has a two-year term and the Senate a six-year term. Uh, it's the difference between short-term thinking and long-term thinking from a political perspective. Um, the other, other thing is members of the House represent a small geographic area where a senator represents an entire state. Um, that means the interests of one particular small area of, of a particular state are, are going to be probably a little bit narrow in compared to the senator's point of view who's representing an entire state in all of the different districts within it. Uh, that changes their approach to how they go about legislating. Legislation tends to come out of the House very, very quickly and pass a great deal and take a very, very long time to get through uh, the Senate. Now, one of the reasons is because in the House, whoever's in the majority is the one that's truly in control of the agenda. That's why the, uh, the last midterm election where the Democrats took control of, of the House of Representatives is significant because they're going to control the agenda of all the legislation that gets goes through committees and goes through onto the House floor. It's all about whoever is in the majority when it comes to the House of Representatives. The Senate, on the other hand, uh, rules on, on unanimous consent, which means you have to strive to get unanimous consent. You ha can't do much of anything in the Senate without almost 60 votes. That means everything has to be um, popular um, or agreed upon. And uh, that's not always possible and, in fact, is quite a bit of a challenge. But those fundamental factors of how they're structured and how they operate um, can tell you and guide you in how to be most effective in advocating at a federal level. So 
in Congress, there are committees, and um, these committees oversee health policy. So right now, for example, a number of the committees that you see here that oversee health care issues are debating and considering issues around drug pricing, as an example. They're having hearings. They're listening to testimony. They are drafting legislation, and they are debating some of these issues. Um, what's important uh, to remember is that while they all cover health issues, they all kind of carve up the healthcare issues into parts. So if uh, there is a health policy issue that's related to how a program operates, for example, um, a grant funding program on nursing education, that would be the purview of the House Energy and Commerce Committee or the Senate Health Committee uh, for an acronym. If it's Medicare payment policy, that would be the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee. And if it was about a funding issue, for example, how much money are we going to give to NIH this year, that would be an appropriations issue, and that's this Labor HHS or LHHS subcommittee that oversees it. So every time that there's a bill that we might care about um, when legislation is introduced, it's going to be going through one of these key committees. So you want to know if your member of Congress is on one of these committees and who chairs it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how to learn about that. But those are important things to consider when uh, when approaching Congress about advocating on nephrology nursing policy issues. So we talked about the legislature, and this is this is just a look at the at the executive branch and the federal agencies that are significant that have some hand and some element of uh, policy issues related to uh, nephrology nursing. Obviously, the P Department of Health and Human Services has a variety of sub-agencies within it. The most significant ones are, are the first three, CMS and what's called HRSA and NIH. And CMS oversees the SRD program. HRSA oversees um, all nursing um, education programs. And NIH oversees um, the institutes that deal with nursing as well as with kidney disease. Uh, the CDC, um, what the other one is called ARC, or, and, and FDA all have a role in touching um, issues related to uh, health policy that's relevant for nephrology nursing. They're just not as prominent um, on our agenda um, as the other three. I have here listed the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs. Those are significant for two reasons. Number one is um, both entities, one, treat patients, and they're essentially health systems. They employ nurses, and um, they also do research as well. And so um, all of both the Department of Defense and Department of Veterans Affairs um, have been areas with which nursing as well as uh, uh, those interested in kidney disease research have found uh, pathways um, for advancing certain policies. And so we keep an eye on them and, and at certain opportunities, we've been engaged in advocating them about, um, as an example, um, allowing um, nurse practitioners to practice the full scope of practice at the VA. Um, the VAs all over the country. Um, that was an important issue that the, that the nursing community rallied around. So we're involved in issues um, at those two agencies as well. Um, a couple other areas that include both the federal government and state that we would point out but um, are a little bit more directed um, and maybe of interest to you individually is one are the uh, ESRD networks, which I think everyone's familiar with. I think there's a lot of good information and data that's useful there on um, their website. The regional CMS offices, as you know, CMS is divided out, and um, it's important to know what they're involved in in your particular region and what region you're in um, under uh, under their map. And then state boards of nursing. I think uh, knowing um, uh, knowing who's involved in that, uh, who's on it, is is another way to get involved at a state level um, and to learn more. And that's where practice acts and everything else that come out that impact um, your practice. And it's something to be knowledgeable of and to stay informed on. And then state legislatures and, and your governor's office. 
Um, the governor oversees uh, your departments of health and, and where that's uh, the policy that they're gonna create and offer. And uh, the state legislatures obviously um, have a hand in, in all these policies as well. So these are all areas to where um, finding out more information or putting it on your radar screen uh, in regards to advocacy um, in your back home, in your state or in your local area um, are important. So beyond that, I mentioned before that it's important in federal advocacy, federal health policy advocacy, that we focus on a critical mass. And ANA has the uh, good fortune of being involved in two uh, very well thought of communities within um, Washington. And one of them is what could be broadly called the kidney community, um, which over the years um, has included patient organizations, physician groups, ANA, &A, uh, as well as LDOs and some of the other um, other providers that make up kidney care partners. Um, and we can call it the kidney community broadly, but um, ANA has been an active member of, of, of kidney care partners. And uh, this coalition has worked diligently um, over a number of years um, on the shift into a bundle payment um, and has worked actively on on, on regulatory issues related to um, the rules coming out of CMS that govern um, the ESRD program as well as, and more importantly, even the quality and sense of program that's part of that bundle payment. So this has been one of the areas where ANA has been um, uh, involved. Um, Donna Bednarski is the um, former ANA president and is the representative of the association um, before KCP. And then I work with her on these issues as well so that we can um, understand what's going on in, in the broader community, what physicians are thinking, what, what's on patients' minds, and it allows us to collectively be one voice before Congress and uh, the regulatory agencies. The nursing community is the other group that we've been um, actively involved in. And um, the nursing community, um, which I was involved in before I started working with ANA, has um, become a very well thought of and organized coalition of national nursing organizations. Um, and many times before, uh, nursing specialties and organizations um, created a lot of infighting and uh, were not successful on Capitol Hill and advocating for certain areas because um, it was perceived they weren't speaking with one voice. But over um, the past 10 to 12 years, they've become very well organized and very, very effective. The focus of the Nursing Community Coalition, for the most part, is around um, funding issues, but they also have started to branch out into other policy issues related to uh, related to the practice of nursing. And it brings together all of these different organizations um, and allows for debate and discussion and allows for um, a unified voice. And groups work together to find the issues they can work on together. And on those that they might disagree, that's fine. They, they'll, they'll agree to disagree, but uh, in the end, uh, we're able to unite around those issues that are significant to, to all nursing organizations. And that, um, that leads to truly effective advocacy on Capitol Hill. A couple other groups I just mentioned, Alliance for Home Dialysis, a and um, sends a representative to participate with this group. And um, we have been a part of signing on to their comment letters to CMS regarding proposed rules and, and the home dialysis elements of that. Um, so we've been an active member there. And then two others that are funding related, Friends of NIDDK, which is the institute at NIH that deals the most with kidney disease research, and the Friends of ARC, AHRQ. Um, they do a great deal of um, patient-centered research. Uh, it's beyond, uh, it's not the type of research that NIH does at biomedical research. It's this other level of of research that's usually fairly significant uh, uh, in regards to um, to nursing care and patient safety, and so we've been supportive of of, of funding for that uh, particular institution as well. And they have seen um, a growth in some of their activities uh, since the Affordable Care Act was um, enacted. So, as a part of the nursing community and the kidney community. 
Um, I would recommend um, a lot of these groups are groups you're familiar with, obviously, and ANA has good working relationships with all of these organizations through coalition. Um, but we have found that some of these groups um, either have good information about um, specific issues, be it patient issues or physician issues, um, and they can be good resources, and um, we often work together. So I consider them, um, these other stakeholders, to be uh, great resources for information, um, as well as some of you maybe members are involved in some of these groups as well, um, and they do a lot of good work and are active, actively engaged in, um, in issues that we, that we care about. And I, I will say at the bottom here, the National Council on State Boards of Nursing is significant. Uh, they have a, a presence in Washington. And um, as I mentioned before, involvement in, in, and knowing a little bit about who's on your State Board of Nursing and what they're up to is important. And um, NCSBN also is involved in licensure compact issues and things like that. So they're a very good um, resource on some of those issues. So where, what else can you learn about health policy? I think ANA is a wonderful resource. Uh, they try to provide uh, training and information and the health policy tab of the ANA website has a variety of information. But if you wanna stay up to date on some of the things that are going on and what you might care about in this general space, um, these are some of the places that we go regularly that we monitor that help us stay informed about what's going on and I'd point out a few of them. Um, nephrology News and Issues obviously has been out quite a while and it's probably a little bit more clinical in nature, um, but they also cover some of the major policy issues going on. National Quality Forum has a lot to do with the creation of quality measures and, um, and the QIP, and uh, I think that that is also a good resource to better understanding the movement towards these quality measures, what it means and, and why it really matters. Um, the other uh, list here, including the Library of Congress or the Office of Management Budget or OMB dashboard and the Federal Register are all areas where um, regulations or legislative information is published um, and it, it's the government having to use transparency to let us know about certain things they're doing. So if a particular bill is introduced, uh, the Library of Congress or congress.gov is going to have information on it. If uh, you're looking for regulatory information, the OMB dashboard of the Federal Register will make announcements about um, rules coming out and rules being finalized and as well as um, other regulations and, and meetings within federal agencies. And so they're great resources uh, to use. In addition, the Bureau of Health Professions at HRSA, uh, they oversee the nursing education programs. If you're an educator, professor at a, at a university, or you know, students, uh, nursing students. Um, there are resources here related to loan repayment programs and scholarship programs and grants to schools of nursing that um, are the largest source of federal money going towards nursing that um, is fairly significant. And this this can be a great resource. You can people can sign up for their emails and get information on when grants or scholarships. Um, our programs are accepting applications. And then if you really just love politics, you want to know what's going on in Washington and you want to keep up, you can get inundated by uh, going to uh, the three most trafficked sites for what's going on in Capitol Hill or Politico, The Hill and Roll Call. Um, if you love it, these are great sources. If you really can't stand all the debate and all the politics, please don't go to these because they will not, the, you, you will find a drumbeat and a constant, uh, constant uh, source of information about uh, what is going on politically in Washington. So uh, like I say, if you like it, go there. If you're not interested, then I would stay away. Uh, so what can you do? How can you get involved? Um, I think this is uh, uh, one of the most important questions. And what ANA wants to do is to make sure that there are resources and opportunities for its members to get involved. Um, if they so choose. And so one is uh, uh, being associated or involved in, in the health policy spend. Um, and I think we can tell you a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, ANA um, has opportunities and openings uh, for participation in other uh, visits or uh, programs or conferences in Washington that focus on health policy related to um, 
nephrology nursing, the ANA health policy workshop, um, which also we'll mention at the end, I think, of, of the call is a great opportunity. Um, the Nurse in Washington internship, ANA usually sponsors one or two people to go to that. And that's focused on the same thing, but just nursing specific and not specific to nephrology nursing. Um, but even from where you are now, um, I would encourage you, uh, especially if you haven't done it before, to schedule a meeting with your local, state, or federal officials. You don't have to come to Washington to get involved in advocacy or advocating on behalf of your profession. Um, oftentimes, it just takes making a phone call, um, meeting someone face-to-face, uh, -face, knowing who they are, uh, knowing what they're involved in, and educating them a little bit about what you do and why it matters. Um, the local um, school board uh, person or the person in your city council is going to want to run for mayor, is going to want to run for Congress, is going to want to be a senator. And all of those people um, are people that you should build relationships with and get to know and, and let them know about how important the work you do is to patients, uh, is for, for your patients. And then in addition, I would I would just say that uh, if you're not if you're interested in campaigns and and those kinds of things then yeah you can you can volunteer for a campaign but just introducing yourself to some of those people and building a relationship will go a really really long way um, and it takes a little bit of the um, if you ever have nervousness about it it takes some of that away so by the time you come to Washington you realize that everyone's just a uh, the, oftentimes these members of Congress they just don't know much about um, every profession they can't know about everything so. Um, when they get to know someone that they like from back home who can tell them about um, their work, they really enjoy it and they actually really remember it. And so if you start at the local level or the state level and do that, it becomes that much easier to do when you get to a, a federal level. Um, and then just the other kind of note that I would put out there that we say to everyone all the time is that run for office. Run for office at ANA, &A, run for office in your local city council, get involved that way if that's something you're interested in. I think having nurses um, um, and nephrology nurses in particular, uh, given where we are in the state of the disease, uh, as well as where we are with diseases like diabetes in this country, the role of nephrology nurses has never been more important. You, you advocate on behalf of your patients every single day. Um, we're trying to get you to advocate on behalf of the profession, but in addition, I think that having nurses involved in government, in elected office or appointed office is extremely important to put a voice to policies that impact the profession and impact healthcare. Um, it's grown over time, um, but we still only have, I, I think at last count, uh, four or five nurses in office in Congress, and I think around 15 or so physicians. Um, we need more to run for office and to get involved. Um, so I put that as a little plug if that's something you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> it's not for everyone, but it's, it can be something that I think could be very beneficial to, uh, to the policies um, that we need in this country related to health care. And then finally, we say vote. Um, it's, it's always been true, and it, it becomes um, extremely important in every election that people get out and exercise their right to vote. Um, I think that um, by doing so, you have a lot more um, skin in the game in regards to the policies uh, that come out at the state and local level. If you've taken the time to vote, then you have a higher expectation of what your um, elected officials are going to deliver in terms of policy. Um, so we encourage you to do that um, as well. So with that, I will uh, I will stop and I will turn it over to um, Celeste and, and see if we can um, take some uh, take some of your questions. All right, thanks so much, Jim. Um, at this time, we don't have any questions. However, we do have about 25 attendees here. So, um, Sandy, is there anything? Um, we'll give them a little time to to comment or post a question. But until then, is there anything that um, that you would like to say or comment on? Sandy is our health policy chair. Sandy. Yes, um, I would. Um, not not too much since we don't have questions. Um, thanks everybody for for joining us. Jim did a really nice to the point presentation, and the part of the title I like is why why does it matter? Um, I 
I'm going into my second year as the leader of health policy, but I had a year as an education advisor. Um, and what we, what our group has decided to do is we, as Jim said, health policy, everybody cringes and they, all they think about is the politics of it all. But let me, let me remind you there's politics in everything, whether it's policies at work or church policies or wherever. So you're not going to escape it. But we've started out by using the word advocacy um, to relate to health policy. It sounds a little better. And we spent last year and we're spending this year um, just introducing you to the concept of advocacy. What does it mean? It's not just for your patients, it's for yourself and the profession especially, and the need to be knowledgeable. And our presentation at um, National, if you're going, is going to be putting some pieces together and then over next year, which will be my last year, we're going to try to take um, take you beyond just the generic advocacy, thinking maybe you've gotten your, your feet wet with the concept, and we're going to start tying into um, the state and federal level, probably more so the state level, because like Jim said, there's a lot more that affects you. We're going to try to um, introduce you to um, knowing your Nurse Practice Act, um, we, we have a glossary that we're of, of all the acronyms um, that has to be approved that we will get to all the health policy spin members and anybody else if they want it. And we're going to concentrate on some focus areas like the Nurse Compact Licensing Act. Um, 31 states currently are practicing it. Um, there are others where it hasn't even been introduced. So we're going to introduce you to that because what that is, is it allows nurses to be licensed in their state and should something happen um, somewhere else, if, the, if there's a hurricane in the state that agree, accepts the compact, New Jersey nurses can go work there. Um, it also is going to take into effect, and why this is becoming important is because of telehealth and telemedicine. Nurses um, taking care of patients over the telephone out of state. So we're hoping that that will entice you into paying a little more attention to your profession as well. And we're gonna we're going to get into legislation versus regulation on a more state level. So that's where our plan is. It's like a three-year plan. We're hoping that next year we'll get you a little bit more hands-on. So uh, that's all I have to say. So thank all you. Right. Uh Sandy, we have a comment from Gail DeWald. I'm going to unmute her line so she can speak. Um, she had a comment. Gail, I have unmuted your line if you'd like to share um, what you posed via chat. Okay. Hi, Gail. Hi. <laughs> um, Jim, one time um, I've gone to my rep U.S. representative's office. It's only about three miles from my house. So I've gone there two or three times. He's not been there when I've had an appointment, but I talked to his aide, and I was focusing at the time on the, um, after three years, Medicare stops paying for transplant meds, and a lot of the patients, I don't know how many, but a lot of them lose their kidney because they stop taking their meds because they're not covered. And uh, the cost of that is then they're back on dialysis at, 80 to $100,000 a year. So this gentleman asked me, you know, how many people are we talking about here? And I really don't have a number and I didn't know where I could get one. Uh, I did research it after, but to me, it felt like he was only worried about budget and the impact of, uh, you know, if we covered the Medicare drugs forever, uh, how would that save us money um, instead of looking at the human factor? And, and I understand it, but is there any other messaging uh, that we, or, or what would you suggest for learning about and, and coming up with a messaging that would be more impactful? Uh, th it's a very, very good question. Um, the The discussion around coverage um, and extending coverage for immunosuppressive drugs has been something that I think is probably ranked amongst uh, one of the top issues um, that we've heard back from ANA members um, that they want to be advocating for um, when they come to Washington. Um, and it's gotten a high response rate from all of us. And, and it has a real connection 
um, um, on the hill when you can walk through and explain it to to some of the staff. And so sometimes you do get a um, an answer that has to do with a, a spend with the spending. And and I'll I will say this is that yeah, it's I, I think it can uh, folks can come off as cold hearted when you when you think about um, only about the the spending element of it, but uh, in a practical way, it's also one of the factors about the ability to actually get it done. And there has been legislation um, introduced in the past several sessions of Congress to extend that coverage, and it wasn't reintroduced this past congressional session. So what was um, um, years seven, uh, 16 and 17? Um, and, and the reason for that was that um, extending the federal end of the coverage um, was something that I think was p folks were starting to see it happen a little bit more at, at the state level in different states. And I guess individualized um, um, insurance or coverage was being done in a different way. And, the, and it became a challenge for um, a number of the other folks in the, uh, in the kidney community. Um, and I'm looking more specifically at maybe the transplant community, which um, ANA is a part of, but isn't as engaged as maybe some others are, um, like NKF. <clears throat> and I've spoken to the folks at NKF as well as the Senate sponsor of the bill before. Um, and I think the challenge is about how much that how much this would cost, and they don't know how exactly how to get that done. So when you speak to messaging it, one of the things that's most important is the collective voice of all of the people who are involved. So nurses, patients, um, um, tra transplant people, other organizations that are involved in transplant of not just kidneys, but in, uh, but in other diseases as well. So um, I don't have an immediate answer on how to phrase it differently. I just say it's a challenge for the people who are involved in um, advocating for that bill and in drafting that bill here in DC. And um, I will have to go back and, and check and get an update on kind of where it is and where it stands um, and see if I can find if there's a more effective way that they would suggest um, educating your, uh, your members of Congress about that. Um, and I'm sorry, who was the member that you had met with before, too, just so I know? Um, he was, actually. he's actually retired and they've hired Chip Roy in place of him. He was the head of the space and aeronautics, and he really wasn't connected much with medical, but he was, you know, a long-term uh, representative there. So, um, sorry, it's Chip Roy now, so I got to start over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do remember who it was. It's like in Texas, like yeah, I, I um, yeah, I think, um, I think that 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 was something I'll, I, I will look into, and I think that's a common thing that that folks face is. Um, going in and talking to someone and having them not understand um, their concentrate on the money and, and we're saying, isn't this an issue that we should solve? Should we find a way to do it? Um, and it's been perplexing for a number of people involved in it. So um, let me see if I can get a better answer for you on that, but that's a very good question. I, I appreciate that. And mm -hmm. I appreciate your trips to DC uh, previously uh, um, um, to Niwi and to other, and to oh, uh, the workshop to, to work on these. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Gail. I'm going to uh, mute you again. And now we have a few comments and questions from Teresa. So um, I'm going to go to Teresa. Teresa, I'm going to unmute you so you can uh, speak to some of your questions and comments. Teresa, you're unmuted now. Go ahead. So one of my questions was um, with the uh, elections coming up in 2020, there's going to be a lot of discussion about, you know, Medicare for all and Medicaid buy-in and all these different things. And um, it would be interesting to know if they're talking about um, this issue with uh, the three-year limit on um, transplant medications um, being involved with all of that. Um, I guess that would be something that we would need to address with the individual um, that's running, but I didn't know if you had heard anything about these Medicare um, alternatives or Medicaid buy-ins um addressing that issue yeah there are there are a couple of proposals that are out now and um a couple of people who um particularly a couple of senators who ha have either announced or are considering running for president have have put forth um uh, proposals related to being referred to as kind of a medicare for all 
uh, proposal. I do not know if if the um, transplant or immunosuppressive drug issue is it would be a part of that or an element of it. As I understand it, um, that the proposals are fairly broad at this point, and I don't know if it goes into that level of specificity. Um, but since it's kind of related in some way to to, to Gail's question, um, I will ask some of the folks that are I think have been involved in that issue specifically to find out um, if that's on the table in regards to um, the consideration of, of, of the drafting of some of these Medicare for All decisions. I would just say from a process standpoint, those considerations, um, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. As we go into a, a, a presidential election year, you're going you're gonna to run into um, a debate and discussion about um, um, about where do we go in the direction um, in regards to healthcare overall. And it's clear that some of the potential presidential candidates are putting out this as a, as a idea or proposal. Um, and so I, I think as they do that, um, details will start to come out and more specifics will start to come out. And I think they will also try to use, uh, these individuals will try to use their position in the Senate um, to propose legislation. So it does actually present an opportunity um, to advocate for certain elements of things like um, immunosuppressive drug coverage um, uh, and whatever it is they design. So I, I think you kind of raise something that presents a potential opportunity um, for that issue. So again, let me let me get a little bit more information since a couple of people have asked about it and just see if um, I, I can I can follow up and I'll I'll provide it to Sandy and to Celeste and then we can um, and then we can see what else uh, might be useful. Um, since uh, y'all both have raised it, and I, I do think it's a, a very important issue and something that's been on the minds of a lot of ANA members over the past several years. Great, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. All right, um, at this time, we do not have any other questions. So um, I'll just close out by thanking you for your time tonight and joining us. Um, I'd also like to announce that ANA will have a health policy workshop um, from June 10th to 11th in Washington, D.C. The workshop will be redesigned a little different than it was last time a few years ago, and there will be limited space available. So just be on the lookout for more information from ANNA um, sometime in February. We'll be getting that information out to you. Um, again, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it, and have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.